and these solar centers depend upon great cosmic suns. But in all cases, energy is available. The right use is rewarded. Wrong use is punished. And the punishment becomes predictable simply from the fact that the wrong use is practiced. You are going to have the effect if you cause it. And this is not a hand of deity with vengeance. It is simply that when we break the law of any form of life, we endanger ourselves. And in so doing, we also endanger the environment in which we live. All kinds of new ideas are coming in. There are going to be a great number of reforms and a great many improvements in human life. But we are living in only one small level of a many-leveled existence. The ancients knew this although they were not able to perpetuate it in, in written form in most cases. But they did know that there are things beyond our perception, and that these things can occasionally brought, be brought within perfect our perception, as in the case of the Sibylline Oracles, or the Oracle of Trophonius, or the Delphic Oracle. The uh, certain vibratory rates uh, communicated to certain persons. Why? Because within themselves this harmony of relationship has existed. Perhaps it is not obvious where it came from. Perhaps this harmony was established in a previous existence, but it is there. And that type of person is capable, therefore, of a certain pre-knowledge, not of what is going to happen, but a pre-knowledge of what is already happening in the energy fields but which will gradually come to, through to the physical. Anxieties, worries, fears, doubts, all these things sometimes represent cracks in the armament which we have built against the world of causes. So we have to find out how to find causes. And the only thing we have to work with is ourselves. And that is why in the ancient mystical systems a whole series of disciplines were imposed by means of which the person came ultimately to be able to see through the veil of Isis, to be capable of passing alive into the subjective world of vibratory causes. And they have some, we have some reports of, this, of such experiences. We have reports of the tremendous universe mm -hmm. that opens as we have the capacity to see, and that we suddenly realize that this world, with all its wonders and phenomena, is nothing in comparison to the unseen that we are surrounded by all the time. This material world is hardly better than a tomb in comparison to the tremendous life that exists in space, a life which can be gradually uh, understood and, learned, and used to perfect or advance the causes of human need. The, these en energy fields will tell us what morality is if we will obey them if we begin to recognize the importance of being right, we will begin to recognize how we can use all these forces for the improvement of mankind. We remember the, uh, the struggles and miseries of Anton Mesma in his effort to show the use of magnetic healing. Today, magnetic healing is rather well established. Very few people know what magnetism is, but they do know that it produces certain definite results. That's just the beginning of something. The universe around us is, the most, is an infinitely powerful thing. It has within it the solution to everything conceivable and beyond conception. But it is closed from us because we have only five inadequate sensory perceptions with which to explore something that goes on forever. Yet every once in a while something happens that reminds us of this particular situation. We begin to realize that the air around us is not empty. That when we look through and see a mountain in the distance, there might be something between us and the mountain that we can't see. And there is. There is more between us than will ever be seen if we get a better, better view of the mountain. Because the great fields of energy that are between are beyond our perception. We see nothing there. But the nothing is because we cannot see, and not because there's nothing there. Uh, the eyes are the uh, limitation that we have in the search for reality. 
And we, these eyes are wonderful things, but they tell us one message, one thing that we can't forget or ignore. The eye can never see anything that is not physical. It can see physical things as tiny as little atoms and molecules. It can go into mathematical formulas that it can't even see. But the, and as long as we deal only with matter, the great mystery eludes us and always will. There is no solution to this world simply in juggling the elements that are here. The world, we've got to outgrow them. We've got to transform them and release higher forms of corrective energy. And the only answer, for instance, to war is peace. And peace is a rate of vibration and war is a rate of vibration. Both are in the magnetic field. Until the war vibration is gradually reduced, until it ceases, peace will be not something brought forth. If peace is the normalcy that remains when the abnormal is removed. All things that are objectionable are here because they await our changing of them. We have set them up ourselves, we are living under them now, and the only way we can ever escape is to get over them. If we can begin to realize this, we will begin to get a new reason for behaving ourselves. We thought, for instance, that virtue is something that everyone is trying to give us because they wanted to impose on us and we wouldn't fight back. This is not the case at all. All that is necessary to this problem is to realize this one thing, that we live in a universe that is larger than physical, more to it than there is in any material phase of life. Some people have thought of it as an afterlife. They thought of it as a place we go when we die. But heaven is a place we build right here if we get to work on it. We will also find that most of the miseries and mysteries of material existence will fade away when we stop causing them. The answer lies again with ourselves. But we have now three or four religions locked in war. We have the planet suffering as it never has from every type of misfortune that is possible to imagine. And uh, any person who has reasonable intelligence can see exactly why we're in this condition. But the idea of changing it is simply beyond our estimation. It never occurs to us that these things are patterns which will remain until we cure them. Just as we finally found a toxin, a, a remedy for simple family diseases, and toxicities, simply we have now that we practically ended the danger and fear of tuberculosis and similar ailments, we have to go out now out after our metaphysical ailments. We have to go out and find the answers to the mistakes we make in our inner lives as well as on the outer life. Uh, when the uh, Rockefeller Foundation put baby fish in the wells and various water tanks down in Central America, the malaria was practically wiped out because it came, the fish ate the lava that caused the malaria. Now that's a very simple physical situation. We've got to find something to get at the mental and emotional malarias that we are suffering from. We should be working for solutions, but we do not know just where to start or how to start. But the only way we can start is to know that within the human being himself there is an infinite capacity to grow. There is a tremendous spiritual asset. There is a tremendous power for good, a vibration we call the human soul, which is a supremely important one, the one that redeems all things. And all redeemers have become part of the great redemption syndrome with which we are all working. Therefore, we have the possibility of discovering within anything we need to know. But we may have to learn to keep the simple rules first. Most of the religions that are now at each other's throats are all bound religiously and spiritually to the doctrine of peace. In other words, we are all supposed to be looking for peace, looking for happiness, looking for uh, good, good and permanent securities. But instead of working for them, we are consciously and knowingly working against them. Now we hope another generation will come along and wipe it out. It won't. We are thinking that maybe tomorrow we'll get a little better. We won't. 
We will never get it over with and get down to the facts until we get back to a battle of vibration in which everything has a keynote which must be kept. Everything has relationships by vibration which we call harmony or inharmony. As long as the relations remain inharmonious, we will have the troubles that we have now. Everything that is negative, wrong, destructive must go. The individual who hates must stop hating. The individual who is selfish must stop hoarding. Everything that is wrong must change. Now we'll say it's not going to happen right away. Well, that's probably true. But with most of us, it can happen a little more if we become aware of it and do what we can ourselves to combat this problem rather than just keep living along with it. We can always try to get a greater harmony. Now, by doing it for ourselves, we may not, not change the course of history, but we will begin to change courses that are constantly annoying us. Uh, in the uh, old religions all taught that the individual must redeem himself, and he must redeem himself by the acceptance of his moral obligations to his world, his God, and himself. This can be done by each person. It will save many hours of illness, if we are able to make these adjustments. And it's time that we try in every way that we can. It is also true that governments have to be built upon integrities. If they're not, these governments will destroy themselves and bring down their own members in ruins. All of these things are cause and effect, but the agency of this cause and effect is not a deity, but a vibratory law. It is something that is the law of cause and effect in terms of a universal energy. There is no need for anyone to administer it, actually, because it is self-administrating. It is there because it is the rule. It is, the, it is built into the nature of things. It is part of that eternal thing we call life. Life itself is under rule, under law. Life has its supreme rules. And these rules are administered by various organisms which arise out of this substance of life. Each animal has its law. Each flower has its law. Each human being is part of the same rule. All these things have rules. If you keep them, they keep you. If you break them, they break you. There's no need of thinking of a God of vengeance or something that's going to forgive sin. The only forgiveness lies in the correction of the mistake. And that is the thing that has to be done, first of all. Now, we also remember in the matter of rocking the boat, that in the course of ages and so on, we have overburdened nearly all of the hygienic facilities of the planet. We have six billion people living on Earth, which cannot or does not renew itself as rapidly as its populations increase. We are no longer in the days of Pythagoras or one of the ancients in which the total population of the world is not much more than 200 million. We are no longer in that world. We are no longer in a world where there is infinite land for all. Or that way we all we can go out and establish our own areas of life with comparative ease. We can no longer do these things. We are in an earth pattern that is becoming more and more complicated. Now, why is it becoming more complicated? I think behind the law is also the fact that we don't want to depend upon escape. In the old times, when it got impossible, they all moved. When the old world was too busy, it was to be created the new world. We've gone everywhere, but nearly every inhabitable area is no longer attractive. We've got them overcrowded. We've got them uh, full of their own problems. We cannot walk out of this complex. We cannot escape the traffic. We cannot escape the factories, or the fumes, or the smog. These things are part of a congestion that has occurred. The only way we can get out of these things is to reduce the pressure of which causes them. One thing is that we now believe that luxuries 
and necessities. We believe that an individual